incredible journey so far, haven't we? And uh, I figured I would start where it all began. Can you so? This really all began with you. What is it about the Death Note series that inspired you to want to turn it into a musical? And what, what were the first steps that you took to get there? Yes. Hi, I'm Yuzo. He would like to start by introducing about his uh, company. He has a history of 60 years of uh, talent management in Japan. They work with theaters as well as making movies as well. When he started working with the company in 2006, uh, at that time the musical in Japan were all imported from outside. He felt the need to produce original musical shows uh, from within Japan. And that was when uh, he uh, had his eyes on the Death Note. Uh, Horikuro was actually the, uh, had the uh, rights to work with the, uh, uh, the movie Chueisha and, and the movie of Death Note. Uh, he had two things that he, he felt that, important, uh, that was important uh, in making this a theater. Uh, 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 the movie a theater. One, uh, it had the, the, con the content had to be something that was popular. で、これに関しては映画でヤガミライトリスが藤原達也という、まあ、俳優がいるんですけれども、その彼が海外に仕事に行くたびにですね、地元の人からライトヤガミって、すごく声をかけられたって話を彼本人から聞いていたので、まず
彼らにもう何度も通って説得してファーストクラスとミュージカルを作る権利をもらうことができました。He really convinced the Shueisha people at Shueisha and convinced them that this is going to be a first class show. で、このミュージカルで一番大事なのは作曲家だと思うんですよね。で、And he also felt that the most、uh, important、uh, part of this becoming、uh, a musical is the music, the music part. で、ポリプロは日本で、えっと、世界的ヒット作のジキルとハイドという作品を、えー、もう何度も何度も上映していたという過去がありました。So, Hori Pro was at that time was,、uh, involved with the、uh, show of Jekyll and Hyde、um, in Japan at that time. で僕はあのデ,デスノートとジキルとハイドっていうのが非常に、まあ、正義とは何かという共通のテーマがあるというふうに感じたんですね。So, he felt that Jekyll and Hyde and Death Note kind of had the same theme, which is、uh, justice. なので、この世界的ヒット作を作ったフランク・ワイルド・ホンさんに、えー、とこのデスノートを頼みに行きました。So this is when he approached、uh, Mr. Frank Wildhorn, the musical theater composer,、um, and made this、uh, project happen. でも最初彼には断られたんですね。But he was denied at, the, at first. <laughs> <laughs> なぜならミュ,ミュージカルに絶対に必要なラブストーリーがないじゃないかというふうに言われました。And the reason he was denied was that、uh, uh, it had to involve the love story of it,、um, which he felt was the most important aspect of the musical. で僕はとってもがっかりしても家でこうがっかりしてたんですけど。He was very、uh, depressed about that. <laughs> でも彼が帰国してアメリカに帰ってきて息子にその話をしたら息子が「お父さんこれはもう絶対にビッグビジネスだからやらなきゃダメだよ」って言ってすぐにフラッグからやりますって返事が来ました。When Mr. Alcorn went back to the US and spoke to his son who was a big fan of Death Note,、um, he said, Dad, you gotta take this job because it's gonna be a big fan.
what is this show going to be about? And it was the same thing here. It was really delving into the characters. And you know, the, the, the writing and the images from the manga are so powerful. And I just started to look at how could we capture that musically. I knew very early on we had to collapse a lot of things. So I don't know if anybody here has, how many people have ever seen the musical? Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay, so there's a few. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do a lot of scenes at the same time. So when you see the show, there'll be, you know, Light's bedroom, the police, the recording studio, Lisa, all happening simultaneously to keep that sort of comic that manga, that manga energy um, of, of, of that steamrolling story. And, um, and then I did find the love story in it. And the love story wasn't your traditional love story. It, there were a lot of love stories. It was the familial love um, that Light's father has, um, the narcissistic love that Light has for himself. <laughs> the, uh, the unrequited love that Rem has for Misa, which I think is one of one of the most beautiful love stories that I've seen on stage is this love story between Rem and Misa. And I really wanted to push that as far as, as I could go. Um, there were uh, the love of justice. So once I sort of started to kind of get all of that, I started to hone down the story, realize where um, where I wanted to focus, which was on that beginning section. And then came the challenge of coming up with an ending. And um, we, I wrote four endings. <laughs> and uh, they went to Oba and Obata, and they approved the ending that is now in the show. Um, still never saw Oba, I've still never seen him, but we did get his approval. And, um, and that was really, that was a huge moment in my, in my life, having, having that approval and, and that collaboration. Um, and uh, yeah, so Frank, the way Frank works, and the way he and I have done about four shows together, um, he'll start writing. You know, he gets inspired by the story, he'll start producing these melodies. And in the same time, I'm honing the story, getting bits and pieces, starting to organize it. Jack Murphy, who's not here today, who did brilliant lyrics. I mean, some of the best lyrics you're going to hear anywhere. Um, his work on this show, really, really fantastic. And, um, and so Jack, uh, you know, Frank would come up with this melody and it would be Hurricane, you know, amazing moment in the show and I'd start to figure out visually what I wanted to see. Jack would start to work on the lyrics and I kind of would negotiate between the two of them and start to form these moments in the show and then kind of link them, see what we had and, uh, you know, with Frank, create an architecture to the score that we felt was compelling, was exciting, was not, we didn't want to get overly emotional, um, you know, too much belly button examining in here that you can get in, in a lot of shows where you're really, you know, getting so internal. We wanted to keep it very powerful and keep the themes huge, because they are, they're massive themes in this. And I think that's the longevity for 20 years. People are just in love with the themes of this, this manga and, and the way they're treated, and you can talk about it forever. You can keep going on about Death Note, about how all the intricacies and, and, and all the subtleties. Um, so it was really important to kind of make sure that all of that was in the show, and um, you kept approving and disapproving <laughs> of the steps along the way until we got to a point where we really felt like we had created something that was faithful, absolutely faithful to the manga, um, but had its own DNA and really felt like a musical that belonged to me on stage. And, and then the, the greatest gift was the acceptance of the fans. Mm -hmm. um, because to have the acceptance of musical theater people was one thing, but to have the acceptance of the Death Note fans, that was everything. Then, then we knew that we had actually created something that was worthwhile in the world of Death Note. Absolutely. And I feel like... <laughs> I feel like you guys did. You, you have been so truthful to the manga and the anime while figuring out the ending, and it, it was astounding. And I think that's part of the reason it's caught on so well is because people do feel like you have accomplished that. And so I want to go over to London now. Jamie, the Death Note English language concert premiere sold out 
the entire thing three in three hours online. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything like that as a West End producer? And what was special and exciting about these audiences? I mean, they were astounding. What was so special about them that was different than your traditional West End show? Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, it was, uh, it's hard to explain. It's really, really hard to explain. We, um, we do a lot of these concerts. We do a lot of Drury Lane, a lot of Palladium. Uh, and uh, a mix of titles, new titles, uh, classic titles, and uh, there's, there's usually there's a West End audience. There's, there's usually when you go to uh, a West End show, there's, there's data that is collected that states uh, how many people or how often they go to the theatre, and most of the time it's the same 99% of people who, who return. Uh, with this, uh, <laughs> it, honestly, when, when we walked, when we walked into London Palladium on the first night, and uh, these incredible guys were on the stage, and uh, we kind of peeped around the side of the side stage onto the, into the audience, and it looked like this, in terms of people wearing cosplay. Uh, it was great, like, literally, it was, you just had like, friends and Mises and Rooks, and it, it was just an incredible atmosphere that we just had never seen before, and the, you, could, you could feel the, like, the, Buzz, the, the vibe in the room, and then as, as it went on, we, we found out that uh, over 25% of the audience members who came had never been to the theatre before, which is about 2,500 people, um, which, yeah, which is incredible. Because like I said, it's usually 1% yeah. have never been, and it's usually their first show, it's usually a young child, or um, they've been dragged by their friends, <laughs> <laughs> not a theatre person, uh, so to have that kind of level of new people to the theatre was a testament to this show and, and uh, mutual theatre fans are diehard, are absolute diehard, and so are anime fans, yes. <laughs> which we, we're all happy to be, and when, by melding these worlds, we've, we feel very blessed to be a part of it, very, very blessed, because as Hayley said, it's the quickest sellout we've ever had at the Palladium, and with, with the first show ever, uh, to be offered uh, another West End run. So we did the lyric, we transferred the lyric for another week as a concert, which doesn't happen. These are, it's supposed to be two nights, ended up being 10, um, just because, and it kept selling out, and it kept selling out, and it kept selling out. And uh, the, my favorite part actually about it all is the, the first show, uh, we usually start the show at half seven. Sometimes, the shows that go on slightly late, and it's usually because people at the bar, people in the toilet, um, uh, it was the merch. <laughs> <laughs> we opened about 15 minutes late uh, because of the merch, merch line. There's no one at the bar. It was the easiest show to get, to get the uh, We sold out the entirety of the merchandise that we had before we opened the first performance. Wow. Uh,
interact that way that are so dynamic and so complex and deep and profound and through the book that Ivan I think Ivan really did an incredible job not just honoring the source material but creating something really compelling to any person who walks in here that watches the show and even if they're not fans of the source they're just going to be transformed by it so my journey just went and followed the book that Ivan decided, what I love about the source material, and just examining and just bringing to life the humanity and the imperfection and the sh almost Shakespearean nature of life. Absolutely, and, and you're amazing. Yeah. And you, Dean, Dean, you're incredible. You are such an amazing light. Um, an amazing elf. Well, sorry, <laughs> you're an amazing elf. What was it like to create this dynamic with light, with with Joaquin. Tell me about that that incredible epic rivalry that the two of you guys have together. What, what was it like to have that on stage? And you just have this like off stage thing going on where you can avoid creating it more, right? We can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> um, and were there any specific scenes? My question really is that you found particularly challenging and rewarding to 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 find together, to find separately. Tell us about that. Hi there, everyone. I'm Dean. Dean <laughs> Al, all the way. And yeah, so to echo what Ivan said there, I wasn't massive, like I wasn't uh, kind of familiar with the manga when I first got into this. I just didn't grow up with it. However, when now fully involved with it, fully immersed in it, it's just taken over my life. And I also, I also knew as well coming into this. Everybody knows the L character. It's so iconic, and he has all of these amazing nuances that he has, all these pictures and images, the foot, the lollipop, <laughs> the sweet switch. I have an incredible sweet tooth, so it's important yeah. hard for me to do that. But yeah, I just knew there was those pictures that the fans wanted to see. So I was like, I need to put those in. So that for me was a huge uh, pressure because I wanted to make sure and ensure that I really kind of encapsulated all of that. And yeah, similar to um, my buddy Joaquin that was saying there, just having you know Ivan and Frank produce this incredible and, and really honor the the manga um, and just kind of set that up as our kind of bible to go to follow, it, it kind of made it really really not easy, but it just felt it felt really comfortable to kind of yeah natural to go along with it, and then to bring kind of my own kind of spin on it and kind of you know to. <laughs> Yes, bring it to a, a, a modern audience. Yeah, it was. I, I love. I love doing that. And it, but the thing, another challenging part of this was in the past shows like Aladdin that I did uh, originated in London. It's so different to this particular kind of character, like completely different. And just kind of having that, you know, space to, to get the opportunity from this wonderful creative team to uh, really kind of delve into that was. It was really, really exciting. Um, Joaquin and I have a little bit of a bromance going on backstage, <laughs> as, well as, as well as on stage as well. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, working with Joaquin has just made my job so much easier. It just feels so, you know, natural and comfortable. And you know, he's a joy to work with both on and off stage. Um, yeah. The chemistry between the two of you on stage is, is just incredible to watch. Yeah. I mean, night after night, just amazing. It's really difficult to hear him. And like, you know, like, <laughs> I, I need to say, though, like when we both booked the jobs, and we were friends before we booked the jobs, he was sending me voice notes about it. And I'm like, no, 
know, I'm like, Nate, you gotta watch this. I made him watch the anime, I made him watch the, the, the two, the, the, the movies? Yeah, the, the, the movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Part one and part two, yeah, I made him watch everything. Um, and made sure that he was fully immersed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, now on to you, our amazing Shinigami, Adam. Oh, yeah. Made up my own backstory. <laughs> um, well, it was, it was a couple of things. The first thing I thought was, and I, there, there may be, you guys would know this. I don't. I, I made up my own thing, but I don't know if there is a backstory or an explanation for the Shinigami realm and these characters and why they're there, and why they exist at all. Is there that? Does that exist? As far as you guys know? Okay, it doesn't. Good, because I made one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, like, you know. Like, why does this horrible place exist? Like, it must be a punishment of some sort. That's what I came to. Like, it, like these characters in, in antiquity, they, they must have been, maybe at some point they were even human at some point, but they were almost like in a, a Greek mythological sort of story, like Sisyphus, like some, some sort of characters, like that they, they did something horrible way in antiquity and, and, and they were punished and they were put into this Shinigami realm to live forever and, if, and, and you're gonna live forever but this is what you have to do and this is how you have to do it. You have to kill people and, you have, and so this, this world was created almost kind of like in Superman, the, the Phantom Zone. You know? <laughs> I, I, I sort of started to sort of like create this thing in my head that like, and it, and it, and it actually gave me a lot of um, uh, sort of sympathy for the character like, like this, he's tortured, they're all tortured, you know what I mean? They live a, a tortured existence. So that was the first thing that sort of came to me and I came up with. And the next thing was more of a physical thing, which was the way he looks and the eyes and sort of almost like the frozen face. And I started to think about, and I've always been fascinated with this idea of spectrums of light and how human beings only can see certain spectrums of light, but there are so many other spectrums that actually exist. There are so many things in this room right now that we can't see, but other animals can, and other, like uh, di different animals and di different creatures see different spectrums of light. And so I thought, well, I think Ryuk sees every spectrum of light, and that's why he's almost so frozen in this, in this, in this, uh, you know, in this, um, in this look because it, it, there's so much um, information coming at him at once, and and so he's and 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 he doesn't get to Earth often. And so he's now on Earth, and, and he's being flooded by all of this visual information, and he's just, he, he can't take it in fast enough. It's just like, it's overwhelming. And so, so those two things sort of helped me figure out something. You know, and I'm still figuring it out, and I will continue to figure it out. As you do as actors, you know, the more you do it, the more things come to you, and the, the richer the character becomes. But that was my, those two things were my initial thoughts with this character, and and gave me a direction in which to take it. It's absolutely incredible. Thank you. Incredible.